Hi, everyone. This is the Snap No Tap Podcast, and I'm Joe Cardinal. And my name is Tony Cicchini. I'm Nico Indovina. What's up, guys? What's up, Tony? We haven't, uh, we missed out on the last couple of weeks because of people traveling this and that. Mr. Cardinal World Traveler there, you were in the, where, Colorado? Tell us about it. How was your trip, Joe? Oh, it was a great trip, actually. We, uh, it's, it was just kind of like our, our trying to do a summer trip last minute. Spent a, a week in Colorado, so we flew in. Um, and after that, we got a rental car, and we probably put over 1,200 miles on that. We went everywhere, all over that state. Saw four different national parks um, and a bunch of other, like, you know, natural uh, landmarks and things like that. And then spent a day checking out Denver. So we were just all over that. I'm actually exhausted. It's one of those vacations you need a vacation from, but you know, I don't know if I'll ever be back again. So I want to try and see, pack everything in. So every day we were driving three, four hours to get to another location. It, it's a, you know, obviously it's a huge state and it just tons of different stuff to see there. So, but it was a great time. You know, it was, uh, most of the family was there, you know, except for Casey who's in Thailand. But um, so it was, it was nice to get everybody uh, packed together and check things out. It's really, it's, it's the diverse amount of things you can do there and, and see and check out. is pretty amazing. So yeah, I don't know. Have you ever been to Colorado, Tony? Well, I filmed the Snap No Tap in Colorado. Yeah, we flew into Denver, but we filmed basically in Boulder. By the way, did you get to see Jeff Goldstein and Costa when you were out there? Not at all. No, I didn't look them up. I just... Uh, Costa uh, Facebook messaged me the other day, and I guess Jeff Goldstein made a comment on our previous podcast about grip strength. You know, I remember I was giving him tips on grip strength in the past years ago, but yeah both of those guys appeared on my um podcast but or i mean on the snap no tap but um basically when we were there we saw a boulder we filmed we'd go get something to eat and we'd we'd crash and <laughs> we'd go back to the motel and big brian uh klaus and we'd stay in a whirlpool and then um you know crash so we really didn't get to see much but um so yeah 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 I, i've so i guess i've been to colorado <laughs> oh yeah i forgot that you guys filmed there are you been there yeah yeah i just recently had some problems from a ticket i got in colorado did you guys get pulled over by the cops when you were out there uh we very luckily did not actually sasha did most of the driving because she gets motion sickness unless like if she's at the passenger and there's so many winding roads and mountains she's like which is nice for me because i can just sit back and chill <laughs> just let her do the driving but uh I mean, it's just inevitable in those, you know, those long drives, you just start to get like a lead foot, you know, trying to get to wherever you're going. Uh, but no, we lucked out, honestly. We were, there was a couple of times where we had some near misses where we'd see, you know, a cop on the side of the road and for whatever reason, he let us go. So we were very lucky in that regard. What happened, Nico? Oh, man. So I had a bunch of problems this week and it, it was due to that cop in Colorado. But uh, it, over the winter time, I drove from indiana to arizona so and me and my son took the trip I, I didn't want to fly because of what was going on with the covid and it wasn't that bad yet but i didn't want to deal with that so i got a rental car drove out to arizona when i got to kansas the cops were on my ass harassing me pretty much for the entire state they pulled me over asked me a bunch of questions then they let me go and then pretty much for the rest of the state i had cops driving behind me and just checking my plates, watching me, following me. I don't know what the deal was. So I got to Colorado and I got a little more relaxed and told my son, oh, good, we're out of Kansas. So we can relax now. I figured the cops were cooler. Well, 
I got pulled over by a cop. He said I was doing 75, which on my speedometer it was showing 70, and uh, gave me a $200 ticket. Sure. And then he told me I could go fight it at the court, which that was very nice of him. You know, I could fly back to Colorado to go <laughs> to court. So I was kind of pissed off about that. Well, I had lost the ticket and I forgot about it. And just last week, or I think it was two weeks ago, uh, I got pulled over by the cops and they said my license was suspended. And it was due to that ticket that I had got from Colorado. So I paid the ticket and I had all kinds of problems. The license has been suspended for a month now and it's supposed to be lifted when you pay the ticket. And there's just been a bunch of negligence between both states and mishandling my stuff. So I've been uh, driving like a fugitive to work. So that's been my week. I had a so, something not quite well. Yeah, I, I, I had a similar thing that I, I didn't pay a, a fine, uh, you know, a traffic fine. I thought I did. And I, I, I'm not, I mean, ultimately, I guess the blame comes to me, but I thought my lawyer dealt with all of that, you know, I mean, and paid my ticket and, uh, or paid the fine, for, you know, like, you know, told me to pay it or whatever. It never happened. So, yeah, I mean, that happened to me. And I'm like, okay, so I got to, I have to take care of this. But my, my license wasn't suspended though. But that's kind of scary to find out that if you get a ticket out of state, you know, that they'll suspend your license. I don't know if that's like that here in Illinois. Um, I think that's totally wrong. It's ridiculous. I was, I, I committed no crime other than driving five miles over the speed limit. They should not suspend my license for that. But it was, that's how they collect their money, I guess. Well, that's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I don't know if there's any attorneys that are listening. They're going to watch this. I should say, maybe they can just write something about that. You know, uh, I'm curious how that works. Yeah. I, I've known people who, um, you know, have done. Yeah. I just, I'm, su I'm surprised about that. That's. I think I might have a case on something because first of all, I have to drive to work. I have no public transportation that'll take me to the job sites. I'm a hundred miles away from my, most of my job sites and my, they didn't fix this problem. So I was suspended for about a month. I'm still suspended and that's my livelihood. So in my opinion, I would have some kind of a case against them because they're mishandling all of my information and it, it's just been a lot of negligence on their part and I've been suffering and paying the price for it. So let me get this straight. So, when you paid the fine, the, the 200, the Colorado. Okay. First of all, what fine did you get in Indiana? What, what ticket did you get? Why did why'd they stop you? They stopped me in Colorado. No, no. The, you said they stopped you in. Oh, Indiana. you know what it was? It was my sticker. My sticker was uh, a month late. Okay. So, so, so that's why they stopped me. But then they found out I was suspended. Then they searched my truck, looking for drugs, take my truck apart. I mean, treat me like I'm a criminal. I mean, to me, is it's totally unnecessary. I mean, I was just driving. I was two blocks from my house. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I know somebody that got, you know, arrested for driving with a suspended license. I mean, he literally got arrested. They were go they were gonna arrest me, but since I was two blocks away, they let me go, and the and I had my wife come walk over there and drive my car back. Or my truck. You got a break because um, they arrested him in his driveway in, uh, of where he lived. They arrested him and <laughs> his vehicle from his driveway. <laughs> yeah, right. And they towed it from his driveway. That's right. That right. should be that should be criminal. That's it, a, that's totally wrong. It, it, well, they did, and you know, um, you know, it, it was five hundred dollars to get his truck out or his. Uh, uh, not it was it was an SUV, you know. It was a, at the time he had a Ford Explorer, yeah, uh, because he was driving with a suspended license. He apparently did not know, like you, that your license was suspended. His license was suspended, which is another little pet peeve. That's pretty serious, you know. Um, and you would think that they would send you some sort of notice, right? Yeah. But, I don't know. I hope that works out for you. I mean, my, my thing is, okay, Colorado said that they were supposed to fix it, reinstate your, your uh, license once you paid the fine. 
And how long ago did you pay the fine? It's been almost a month. Yeah, so it should have went through the system. Um, you would think that there's, yeah. it's instantaneous. I mean, it should be at this day and age. It's just a wire transfer more than likely. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, you may have to talk to somebody. Oh, I've talked to many people. No, I mean a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I just want this whole thing to go away. But yeah, if it, if it continues, I'm gonna have to. Well, okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. You know, um, I'm surprised now that Joe didn't get a ticket for indecent exposure if they saw his face. <laughs> you dodged a bullet there, Joe. Think well, about- I kept my pants on most of the trip. So. Well, <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Um, well, let's see what's been up with me. Uh, well, you know, my friend, my chiropractor friend passed away. It's gotta be four or five weeks now. And, um, like three weeks ago, we had a memorial fundraiser for him. Well, for, I don't know how you want to look at it for him, for his, um, widowed wife, um, was a very poor turnout, which really disappointed me tremendously um it was from like 12 to 3 and i just left at 10 to 3 because it was heartbreaking but you know i helped set everything up the tables outside and the chairs which were never used (laughs) and i think during the three hours that i was there because i got there about a quarter after 11 um maybe maybe 20 people showed up and out of the 20 one was his son, one was his ex-wife, one was his wife. Um, so um, take take that out and then take me out of the equation. So, yeah, it may have been, I don't know, 20, if, if that. It kind of bothered me, bothered me a lot. And then um, just, you know, dealing with the issues with, uh, you know, at home here with my mom and it's just not um, not well. It's deteriorating quicker and uh you know it's i don't know what i'm gonna do um that's like a big thing and uh a few people emailed me about joining the tri c program specifically um and uh you know so i not nobody's signed up yet but like i told the one guy or emailed the one guy I said i'm only taking three people you know three um three new enrollees let's say now that means not, not, I don't count you and your training partner. That's, that's to me like one enrollee, but so, you know, uh, the COVID is, you know, these quarantines or whatever they're, I mean, they, they may be rescinding somewhat, but things aren't, aren't right. Things are, you know, it's just difficult. And a lot of these people, I guess, from out of the country, because I did not know this, they're on travel restrictions, so they can't even come to the U S. So if they were, were to train with me, now's the time to do it with the, with the video distance learning, um, just got to wait and see what happens. Otherwise I'm just going to, you know, try to make it through the rest of the year and then shut down shop, you know, um, and you know, cause I can't go without an income. You guys are at least working. I'm not, you know, so this is ridiculous already. How many months has it been? Six. Last time I coached was in February. So, um, six solid months, no unemployment, no loans, nothing. So forget it. It's not going to last much longer. Um, so, what, how's your job going, Joe? Are you still working from home or are you going into the city now and then? So I'm, I, the way our team works is we, we need at least one person on site on campus. So we have a rotation. So at least once a week, um, I'm, uh, yeah, going downtown. I might make it like every other day. So I might do like Tuesdays and Thursdays where I commute in just to get some certain stuff done that I have to do with the hardware on site. Uh, but I'm lucky yeah, working in IT, I'm, I'm able to do a lot of my work remote. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a great opportunity. Yeah. I technically can do it too. You know, um, Nico cannot obviously, but see America is a service related industry. And basically what, uh, what I do is a service. Um, you don't Joe, um, and Nico is more, it's not necessarily a service, but Nico is more of an infrastructure, uh, you know, basically let's label it a construction kind of thing. Um, so that's really important. Um, but yeah, America is a lot of service related jobs, you know, and it's been that way for many, many years, you know, restaurants, bars, um, you know, car repair, which reminds me, I got to get an oil change. Um, you know, things like that. So it takes a hit. 
Chicago uh, still hasn't opened um, the bars that don't have a food license. They still cannot operate. So like I said, I know two people that own bars that are never opening again. They said, that's it. Um, and I don't think that they're going to change their mind. And, you know, it's, it's just a shame. Um, so I'm, yesterday I was driving down Route 12 and I was in, I believe it was Lake Zurich. And it was a Saturday and it was probably 5 p.m. ish, maybe, maybe 5.30, it doesn't matter, but the LA Fitness was closed. All right, totally closed. No cars in the parking lot, nothing. Now, I know Planet Fitness is technically open. I don't want to go there because, like I said, this place was not cleanly even before this COVID. Um, but I was kind of surprised to see LA Fitness closed on a Saturday evening, if, if you want to label it an evening, late afternoon. Um, and I talked to somebody a couple weeks ago or a week, week and a half ago that is a member of LA Fitness, and apparently she said her gym was open, so I don't understand why it would be closed on a Saturday afternoon. But, um, yeah, uh, that, that's <laughs> certainly not good. And um, what else did I check out? A restaurant. I didn't go there, but I looked online because somebody was asking me about it. I forgot even right now the name of the restaurant, but it was not a buffet restaurant or anything, just a regular restaurant, and it's closed. It says temporarily closed because it is COVID. So I'm sure that that restaurant's not going to reopen because they've been closed for so long now. It's hard, you know, tough times. And now winter's coming pretty soon, right? How many more months? Well, technically December, but, you know, out here it gets cold quicker. <laughs> yeah, November. I'm yeah. trying not to think of it. Yeah. I don't know. Don't want to let go of summer just yet. Yeah. Well, this has been the most bizarre. Well, when I had my aneurysm in 93, it was June 1st when it happened. So, and I, I was in two hospitals for a total of three months consecutive, consecutively. You know, I went from the main hospital to the rehab hospital. So I didn't get out of the rehab hospital to the end of August and I was all messed up. So that summer was gone. I didn't have a summer. So that was the worst in my life, but this has got to be like the second worst. And, and in a way, because I'm active or, or uh, coherent and able to do things, it was, it's very frustrating to not be able to do things. You know, and I tell everybody, you know, I like to go to Chicago a couple two, a couple, at least once a week or twice a week. And there's no point in going because every place that I like to go um, restaurants or, you know, just hanging out with friends, everything's all the places are closed. Um, for the most part, there's a couple that are open, but they're late night. They don't, they don't open until like four in the evening and they have to close at midnight. So I'm not going to be driving back. I can't leave my mom alone like that. I can go during the day when there's somebody here to watch her, but yeah. So it kind of stinks, you know? Um, oh, well, you know, other people are going through it too. So we're not alone and I'm certainly not alone. And I think the, pl the small businesses that I do go to, I think they kind of like appreciate me and they know better than to, complain because at least they're open for business and I'm not open for business. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, not by my choice, but this online stuff, you know, or downloading videos, people need to do that. Um, you know, it, it, take advantage of it while you can, cause I have the time right now. Um, but yeah, other than that, you know, not much is going on. Um, I got, I got, I'm going to take care of one of the rooms in my house on Wednesday. Just do a little touch up. I mean, I'm the world's best renter, I guess. You know, most renting people don't want to take care of the house, but I've done everything. I painted three rooms. I've painted the outside of the house. I've done so much stuff around here, and I don't even ask my landlord to take it off the rent. I just spruce this up i did some electrical work here through the years that i've been here and everything so um i don't know you know i'm just getting trying to occupy my time why don't you go rent my house tony I need, <laughs> I need some updates yeah right right well I mean, it's happening you know once things you know i i can't really my mom's in the other room so i really can't really get into this too much right now i don't want to but um yeah it's just uh you know, i'll be probably packing it in and, uh, you know, originally my, my thought process was to 
get closer to the city, you know, find a regular job. Um, now, finally, after coaching for 26 years, because, um, you know, unless things change and people start buying my products and training with me, uh, I feel bad for them because then they're going to, they're not going to have this world-class catch wrestling training anywhere. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, but that's just the way I, based on the stuff I've seen. I mean, um, uh, um, uh, well, Jesus boy, see my, my brain just goes, uh, to mush. Um, you know, Josh Barnett, that's what I was thinking. He's good. You know, Eric Paulson, although he's not pure catch wrestling, he blends so much stuff. Um, but that's not a knock on him. I'm just saying he's, um, you know, uh, I don't know if, if he would just be able to teach straight catch. I know those guys have, you know, trained off my videos and stuff, but they do a lot of other stuff. So if you wanted to learn what I do and the self-defense aspect and, and all that, you're not going to be able to get it anywhere. That's, that's a shame. Um, Javier's very well accomplished world champion, but Javi doesn't teach like the self-defense stuff. I, I, we never got into that with him. Um, as I think we talked about this before, didn't we? How most of the guys that I train all just wanted sport <laughs> and they didn't get to learn my whole system. Um, cost is pretty good too, you know, um, but again, he's there in Colorado. You, you can't have just, you know, one guy. Um, so yeah, I got to start worrying about, you know, as I'm getting up there, <laughs> I'm getting pretty old. So I got to worry about my, the last phase of my life, I guess the last section of it. But, um, yeah, and I wanted to take a trip back to Cleveland this year, you know, this this summer. And, you know, um, there's no point now. Well, I can't really. I mean, I, with with everything being shut down and, and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I just wanted to do it. I I saw that one of my high school buddies had a mild heart attack, um, JR. He had a mild heart attack a couple of months ago, which – and then he wrote again that he's doing fine. But that's kind of – we played football and everything. that We were a football team together. And um, it was just – yeah, just – I've lost so many people. I don't want to see people my age, my contemporaries, passing away like this. Not that he's going to. He's fine, but it's just kind of like a wake-up call. You know, he's got to be – he's got to be my age. You know, I don't remember his birthday, but, you know, we graduated together. So, with, with he's either my age or within a year. So, you know, a year older maybe, but that's – what about you, Giuseppe? Well, you know, you triggered some of my thoughts that I had when I was on my trip because um, kind of like the idea of taking advantage of things while, while you have the opportunity to um, kind of like in regards to training or any, anything really. I was, you know, a lot of these places we visited, you kind of had to hike up to them or hike through them. Like one of the um, uh, places we checked out was the uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park, which was kind of awesome. It's the, the highest sand dunes in uh, North America, like 700 feet high, these these uh, sand dunes go. But, you know, if I was, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years older, you know, or I'd done something to not maintain my mobility, I couldn't get in there and hike around. You know, if I didn't keep my cardio up, um, I was actually kind of concerned because it was hot out. You know, they, they were in the 90s, a lot of the days we were there. Fortunately, we it was a little overcast, so we weren't getting beat down on the sun. But some of the other, like we went to the uh, Rocky Mountains National Park, again, you know, spent an hour, 90 minutes hiking up, you know, up and down, you know, hills and mountains. And, you know, if, if I had waited, and it's the same thing with the grappling training, you know, like if, you know, if I postpone and I keep waiting, I'm not going to have the same mobility or ability, you know, or for that matter, my coaches, you know, like I said, there's a finite window where you can kind of do these things. Um, so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword is, you know, you kind of need to do these things as soon as you can. Obviously, not everybody has the opportunity to, uh, but you also don't want them to do anything that could like, I don't know, like I, I worry about like, geez, if I do something or like if I overtrain or if I, if I get reckless with my training, you know, I, down, the route, down, the, uh, down the road, I might inhibit myself from being able to do or see these things, you know, so it's kind of an interesting balance. It's like, you know, if you want to train, train now while you've got your health you know, and you've got your mobility, or if you want to see things, you know, I've seen, I saw some older people there and they were just excluded from being able to, because I guess one of the things is I always feel, oh, when I'm older and I have more time and I'm not working, I can go see and check out these things. But, um, you know, do what you can while you've got your health too, because that, that this kind of became very clear to me that like, I would have missed so much if I didn't have that ability. If I didn't keep my fitness up, 
you know, also being at, at altitude. I mean, uh, Denver itself, you know, 5,000 feet up and everything was above that. So um, uh, did the altitude affect you at all, Tony, when you were out there? Did you notice it? I did not. Um, but that's not to say that it didn't affect me. Um, but trust us, trust me, we were all in a very small room with lights, professional uh, studio lights, you know, coming down on you. Um, there's it now. Let, let, let me talk about that process a little bit, because before I did it, you know, they asked me what, you know, what do you need? And well, I was all injured. You know, I had torn my I had broken my hip. I had my bicep torn and collarbone broken, which I actually didn't know about it. My labrum was shot. I knew all about that. So I was in constant pain. So I said, get a lot of um, ibuprofen, you know, just have tons. And I, I knew that I was only going to be there for a few days. You don't want to be living on these pills, but for a few days, I, it's okay. And I was taking gobs of it to get through this. And then I had fruit juices and stuff like that. But unlike when I filmed The Lost Art of Hooking, the law started hooking. We would film a scene, stop, wait two minutes, and film the next scene. It was just go, go, go. And I think I mentioned there was only two outtakes, and one was because the guy's phone was ringing, and the other one was because Bruce made me laugh because I couldn't talk. <laughs> and, but when we did the snap, no tap, um, they filmed it, uh, the, a scene, and then the guys were watching the scene. They would replay it to make sure everything was cool. And um, I love those guys that did it. They did a great job. But that screws the rhythm up, okay? I want to keep going. Because when I do this, there's no scripts. When I went to the, do the lost uh, Snap No Tap, they had charts from other uh, authors, as they call them. They still had them up on the room with all their notes and their crib notes and this and that. And uh, even at World Martial Arts, when I did the Lost Art of Hooking, somebody else that had been there before, he was looking through a book you know, just trying to figure out what to teach me. I'm, I'm not, let's just go, you know, I'm, I, I, I improvise. Let's go, go, go. So this all ties into answering your question because um, I had a lot of, I guess you could say I had a lot of rest periods while I was filming the snap, no tap. So for every scene you see, if the scene was five minutes long, well, then we got a five, roughly a five minute break or so. Okay. If the scene was 10 minutes long, then we had a 10 minute break. Um, but be that as it may, I was so banged up making that video um, that I, I mean, I was fit, but I was in a lot, I was in a lot of pain and um, I just want to keep going. I want to keep it rolling. You know, I didn't like the stop and go stuff, you know, but it, it, it's the way they needed to do it. And I still think it's probably my best series. Um, and as I said, um, Dave and the other guys that were behind doing all of that, they did a, they did a great job. Um, but look at Paladin Presses, who, you know, were the producers, and they're out of business. You know, they went out of business a couple, two, three years ago because of pirating, which is what I've had to live with for years and years. And, um, you know, there's no way they said to combat it because they had so many um, different products, books, and different video authors and so on. And, it would have taken a team of, of guys working around the clock to try to get all these uh, pirating uh, websites down. And there, of course, many of them are overseas. And, you know, I remember years past that I would talk to the FBI about this. Hey, can you help me out? You know, and uh, I'm just a little guy, you know, if I was Paramount Productions or MGM or something, then yeah, uh, pirating would probably be less of an issue. But, um, it pretty much destroyed me financially from a business standpoint. And, you know, and it hurts you guys because I won't make videos again. Why should I go through the expense of doing it? Um, when people are just going to steal it. And we talked about this before they're felons. You guys are criminals that download this stuff. There's no way to sugarcoat it. When you download anything illegally, you're now no longer a good, you're not one of the good guys. You're one of the bad guys. So, um, and it's a pain, you know, to, to get everybody correlated because that was both of those lost art of hooking and, um, snap, no tap was about a week long, uh, you know, video thing. And we still didn't get everything I wanted filmed in both series. There's still things today that I wish I could have done, but you run out of time. So you got to get the producers to, you know, get the, the fit cameraman. Then you got to get the guys 
like, you know, the, the assistants that are going to help me, you know, I can demo on and whatever. And look at us. It's, it's hard for us to coordinate just a simple little hour and a half, two hour podcast. Imagine if you guys had to take a week off of work, you know, and, and, you know, you don't get paid because, you know, um, there's, we don't get any money to, to film it. You know, we make our money hopefully on sales. So, uh, yeah, there's just no, there's no reason for me to want to do it again. Um, you know, unless I was guaranteed a substantial, um, amount of, uh, money because it's a, it's a big investment, you know, of, of time and, and effort. So, and I'm not alone. You know, I, I know publishers, I know, or, you know, authors, book authors and musicians that are like, we don't want to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What about making books, Tony? I mean, I know that's very time consuming, but it's time consuming, but again, they, the, the, the stuff gets pirated, you know, I mean, it, it truly does. Um, and while I, I'm an orator, I, I got a big mouth. I like to talk. I, my thoughts race around sometimes. Okay. And it's very difficult for me to try to calm down and, and put it in, in a writing form. Matter of fact, my buddy Vince, who's, uh, you guys know him and, uh, well, I don't think you've met him, Nico, but, um, he's on one of my, you know, boxing oriented videos, um, but I've known him long before that. And he became a student of mine. He's done some books, just throwaway books, you know, like self, uh, self published, you know, uh, print on demand, he sells them on Amazon, like fun books, nothing serious. And he wanted me to do a couple, not catch wrestling related, just, you know, fun stuff where you don't really care. And I wouldn't mind doing that. But even for me, it's just, it's just difficult. And he keeps telling me, record it into your phone, transcribe it, you know, have it transcribed and email it to me or something. But I don't know, Nico, I have a block with that. And then if we were to do a book, because for years, people wanted me to do the book. Well, now we have to get a gym. I no longer have my gym. So um, just train out of here, you know, and we could, I don't want to film out or, you know, take pictures out of here. Uh, we'd have to get a gym. We'd have to get photos taken, blah, blah, blah. And, and now again, it, it becomes where you're relying on other people to set things up and it's difficult. So what's, what's the payoff in the end? You know, 26 years, I think I've given a lot away for free through the years. So it's not like I need to continue to do it. I, I need a little, little love in return. You know, um, I think when I lost my gym, that was the biggest turning point in my life that I realized that these people in the martial arts community don't really give two shits about Tony Cicchini. Um, because somebody wanted to, somebody put up a fund, go fund me to help me. Cause I was in dire straits and only one person, ever, and it was up for a couple, three months and only one person ever donated. And that was a student of mine in Chicago. And he did it strictly to try to, um, entice other people to do it. And even on my Facebook page, when I begged people, I said, I don't want a handout, just buy my products. I know you guys don't buy them, buy them, please. Three people did. And I'm thankful, but I made like 130 some dollars or less than that. Um, actually 120, no, no one, yeah, 130 something when you factor it in, not counting the shipping. So after all those years, 20 some odd years of me giving, giving, giving and housing people and training them for free or one hour lesson becomes an hour and a half on the house. Uh, nobody helped me. Nobody raised a finger. Um, except for, like I said, a couple of people and that turned my stomach. I'm like, Nope, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, they burned their bridges with me. That's, that's the word I'm saying. You know, people have honestly burned their bridges with me because, you know, we're supposed to be a little fraternity, like a family, you know, and we're supposed to be there to help each other out when things get rough. And I still continue to do that. And I get guys that I've never met who've never bought a product from me in their life and probably never will, who are in terrible situations right now, borderline suicidal, and they email me and I, and I try to, um, resp I respond to all of them and I try to give them help still, emotional help any way I can. But like I said, when, when, when I needed help, um, you know, it wasn't there. So Nico, I'm not motivated now to do something just for the hell of it. Cause I've, I've, I've done enough of that. So, um, I would need a guaranteed large amount of money up front. 
um, you know, like let's say a publisher, like a real publisher would give you um, an advance or I think that's what they call it. Uh, I forgot what the term is in the publishing world, but yeah, I would need something like that. And then I'd say, okay, you know, if you're going to guarantee me, you know, 75,000 or a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Then, then, then now we're talking now I'll do something, but. What, what about the, the videos you could download and stream? Do those get pirated? I'm sure they do. All of my products have gotten pirated. Everything has gotten pirated. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, it's sad, you know, and not just for me, it, this is everyone who has, who's put their, um, life life's work out there um but if somebody wants to make me an offer to buy my products you know like the the, the rights to selling them if like you're some marketing guru i mean it's going to be a lot of money um but if they wanted to do that and they think that they have a way around this and they can market it to a different group of people who may not know of my stuff or whatever so they didn't pirate it, then make me an offer, but it's going to have to be six figures. It, you know, I'm not going to sell my stuff for under that. Uh, that's a fact, but you know, this is just, you know, now that we're talking about finances, yeah, that's just the way it would be. You know, you want to buy catchrussell.com, the website, and all my products, we're talking, we're starting in six figures. Okay. It wouldn't be like, Oh, you can do it all for 10,000. No, not going to happen. Um, so yeah, what are you going to do? You know, my, my, my last option is to actually train people, which with the tri C program, like unlike anybody else, everyone is, I gear it towards you. Yeah. You get all my videos, but that's not, I don't tell you, like I heard other styles do that. Other famous people buy all they, you download their products. They don't train you. You got to watch the videos and basically teach yourself. And then you go test. That's not what I do. You know, mine is all step by step. You know, Nico, you need to work on your head moving. Let's. This is how you do it. You know, or whatever. And then Joe would be Joe. You need to work on uh, lifting or something. You're you're weak. Or whatever. Everything is custom, and I can do that because it's not like I have one thousand tri C members. You know, it would be it would be impossible. Um, so, yeah, the best thing is the direct um, training, the digital or the online you know, training. Yeah. But, you know, it's out of my hands, you know, I'm willing to offer it there. You know, it's been there for many years. So it's up to people to take advantage of it. So now what? Next question. <laughs> well, I'll say this though, going back to your earlier point, when, when you lost the gym, we did have some good support from the local grappling community. We had that, that one Chicago, 10th planet guy who let us do some seminars afterwards. And I, like I said, he was one of the few, you know, and I do appreciate that. That was really nice. Once a month, he was allowing us to use his gym. Um, but you know, even then the, the, the seminar, the turnouts weren't what they should have been. Um, unfortunately. And again, it's like scheduling and it happened during the heart of the, heat, the, mid, the summer. And, you know, then all of a sudden here comes the holidays yeah, so it was kind of difficult, you know, just things just didn't work out. But again, I reach the world, international, you know, it's all over, not just nationally, not just locally, nationally, internationally. And that bothered me, you know, that, that all these people who throughout all the years, oh, Tony, you're the best, Tony, you know, we love you, Tony, Tony, Tony. Well, for what, you know, I, Tony needed help, just like Tony needs help now. I'm not going to turn to these people because I know that they're, you know, they just don't, they don't give back. You know, it's like pay it, pay it forward. And I've done that so many times in my life. And, you know, it just kind of, it, you know, I have resentment. There's no question about it, but I've dealt with it. I've internalized it and figured it out because it's, you know, using REBT, it's like people, you know, they're, they're not obligated to do anything. You would hope they do, but if then they, but if they don't, what I learned in psychology is then you just move on. You just cut them out. You know, you can't like expect the dog to meow. Okay. If you want a meow, you got to get rid of the dog and get a cat. So it's the same way here. Um, the thought was nice. I would, I, I always hope that, yeah, these guys will rally around me and, uh, it just, you know, it just didn't happen. You know, um, truly it just, it just didn't happen. So, 
There's literally nothing I can do about it. But to say I was shocked, especially GoFundMe, because, you know, you get people who put up frivolous stuff, right? And then they get responses. Me, I have a worldwide audience. And as I said, outside of my, my friend who donated just to kind of like spur it on, I, I literally got zero, not one single human being. Um, I don't know. I've accepted it. I think that the people will probably feel more guilty than I do. I didn't do anything, you know, just, Hey man, you want to help me out? You know, and you know, it'll come back to you in products or instruction. It wasn't, you know, so yeah, it's not cool. It's certainly not cool. Like, like now, like I told you earlier today, the doctor that had the fundraiser, you know, I was there for the fundraiser, you know, I'm, I was going to help out. I mean, you know, I didn't, you know, he was a friend of mine. He was just somebody that I didn't know that well, but well enough. I enjoyed talking to him um, and, you know, hanging out with him. And he, you know, he did some work on my ex-wife. He did some work on me. And, uh, you know, I was there and I feel terrible that they didn't get a better, they didn't get a better turnout. You know, it's, it's all about supporting each other. You know, it's not that big of a deal, but just don't, it just, you know, just doesn't, didn't happen, you know. So that's all I have to say, I guess. Well, you mean you, you brought a couple, actually triggered a memory for me. So you know how you can make a dog sound like a cat though, right, Tony? How? You leave it in the freezer overnight, take it out in the morning and get a chainsaw, meow, cut through it. Or you can make the cat sound like a dog by just covering it in gasoline and light a match and woof. Yeah, you're you're still suffering from uh, altitude sickness. I think you know you 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 got airhead right going on right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I I have some things I could say, but I'm not going to. I I've heard good <laughs> ones lately, <laughs> but I they're not for public uh, consumption, I guess. But uh, yeah, so I think I'm gonna start practicing pool again because believe it or not throughout all this COVID I have not been and uh I did shoot a couple of games or more, more than a couple like maybe 10 games 11 games not at once but just like if I would would go out and then this one guy that I know will shoot one game you know and he likes to play bank which is my game I'm a bank pool player so I'm like okay but I'm you know I got to get back into shape you know for for shooting it shouldn't take me all that long but, you know, just now it's going to pass the, the time. As a matter of fact, it's what I'm going to, you know, just try to focus on that for the, at least the next month, you know, all through the rest of this month and let's say September. Kind of bear down and, and see what, what comes up with that. Just give me something to do. What's your uh, move thing? How's that looking, uh, Nico, about selling your house? Uh, so far, it's looking pretty good. I mean, I put it on the market and within the first week I had like, 20 people schedule a showing so that's oh, good so, seems to be a hot item but no offers so far have you found your new place yet Do you know where you're going no i have not um i'm gonna move somewhere temporarily but i haven't found a place that i'm gonna buy yet so what are you you're thinking you're gonna rent some place or something or move in with somebody that you know no, I'm going to move. I'm moving to a property that's a family property out south and um, I'm going to stay there until I find a place. Good. Yeah. I'll, like I said, I'll probably be in the in that boat. Um, you know, I'm hoping to make it through the rest of this year here with my mom and, you know, maybe spring or something. We'll see. I don't, you know, that, again, see, that's another that's frustrating because things are out of my control, you know, um, and, uh, there's more to it. There's a lot of behind the scene things, you know, with uh, insurance, you know, or, or whatever. There's a lot. Um, so, yeah, I got to figure. I mean, there's only so much I can figure out on my own and the rest is kind of like it's up in the air. With you, you can be a little more proactive. I really do hope you sell your house, you know? Yeah, I think the, I think the big issue with everybody likes it but the main issue is I have association fees and they're kind of expensive. So I think that's what's turning people off right now. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because my, my one friend over here, um, Scott, he is, well, his girlfriend's moving in with him 
And Scott lives with his parents. He takes care of them. His dad is in his late eighties, has Alzheimer's and stepmom is younger, but than that, but still. Um, and he was talking well when his dad passes and, you know, his stepmom gets the house, he's going to move. And he was thinking about uh, buying this quad complex and not the whole complex, but buying one unit. And I said, you know, you got to watch out for those homeowners association. First of all, they can be terrible with their rules and regulations, but it can also be expensive. And he's, you know, telling me what he thought it would be. So just last week I did this just out of curiosity. I went online and I started looking at condos or townhouses or homes or whatever around the general area here. And you're right, man. Um, I've always said, you know, one of the things that about the negative about owning a house, especially out here is you never get your taxes back, you know, so taxes can really cripple you. Well, I, I was looking at some of these homeowner, these uh, things at 70,000 or $99,000, uh, which doesn't sound like much. And then you click on it and it's like, the home, but they're in a home, even though they're, they may not even be traditional condos or townhouses, they may be actual houses, but they're still in a, you're sub subject to homeowners association fees. And I'm looking at this stuff, 700, 800, 900 a month. The cheapest wow. I was seeing was like 550, 600 for homeowners association fees. You know, and then if, plus you have your, your taxes on top of that. I mean, you're cheaper to rent. I mean, I'm sorry, but now you're, you're, you're spending damn near um a thousand dollars a month in just in fees and then you have your mortgage on top of that i i was startled when i saw this because i didn't you know i was unaware of anything like that um yeah that's just insane that's super expensive uh, mine is nowhere near that price but definitely enough to deter people well I, you know, I just have, you know, read through the years horror stories about homeowners associations, you know, about the, the, the terrible things that they do to people. You know, if they don't like you. They can make your life like a living hell. So I was always now I've never owned a house, but I was always told, you know, whatever you do, don't ever, you know, don't ever do a homeowners association thing because, you know, it, it you know, it could um you can, you could end up regretting it. You know, you got to really look into it and, you know, do a lot of research. You know, it's kind of like moving into a neighborhood blind. Well, you're moving into two neighborhoods. You're moving into the neighborhood in general, and then you're moving into the homeowners association thing. So you got to see who's on the board of directors and, you know, what's going on and this and that. Um, but yeah. Uh, I was just startled when I saw this. Now there were some that were more reasonable, I guess, 230, 240 a month. Um, but then again, the house was more or the, the condo was a lot more, you know? Uh, so in the end, you're not really, you know, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, but yeah, I could see your point of, of having a homeowner's of fee, fee that could, you know, um, derail sales, like owning property here around where I live on, on the water that there's a lot of them up for sale and they've been up for sale for a long time because people just can't afford the taxes. Taxes are, extraordinary you know i mean the one guy that i knew you no know, uh he's twenty thousand dollars a year Dang. just in taxes right here on the lake i mean and there's nothing on the lake it's all there's no commercial yeah yeah 20 grand um a year Th this is i mean that just boggles my mind i mean i guess if you have the money no big deal but i mean to me that you know that's just I can't fathom what I could do with, you know, 20 grand. And I, and I know somebody else, she had a foreclose, I guess, um, they foreclosed because of circumstances and she was nowhere near the water and her taxes on her house were like 14,000 a year. This is, you know, these are not expensive homes. Okay. These are not like mansions we're talking about here. These are just modest, regular homes, you know, but it can get, it can get, it can get crazy. I would assume in Indiana, your taxes are less than Illinois, but imagine California, New York, or other places, you know, Massachusetts, Boston area. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the taxes are really low, Indiana. Uh, what happened with my association is they had 
whoever was the president and was running the association in the past basically robbed them blind. He took everything. And by the time they found out, it's like they're in the middle of a crisis. So they got to raise up the fees just to get by, you know, for the, and this has been like probably four or five years since they got robbed. And there's no, no sign of them lowering the, the fees anytime soon because they're still recovering from what happened. Yeah, that's the thing. Again, you know, who, who, who are on these boards? Uh, how do they get on the boards? How do you get them out of the boards? Uh, you know, and they can really wreak havoc. Um, and, I, you know, conversely too, uh, renters, you know, you've got to find a good landlord. There are, there are a lot of bad landlords. You know, they call some of them are even so bad, they call them slumlords and this and that. They don't want to uh, redo things. You know, my landlord's cool, you know, um, but there's some that just aren't. And, uh, you know, so it's like all about relationships, you know. Um, but even in Chicago, you have aldermen. Now, you may move into a neighborhood where um, – so you don't have homeowners association, let's say, but now maybe you have bad neighbors or just things and you got to make sure you have a good alderman because sometimes you need to go to the alderman to, to say, Hey, you know, the streets torn up or there's, there's cars speeding down here at all hours of the night. You know, what can you do about it? You know? So it, it you know, there's a, I guess there's a, a lot to look into, you know, um, some people like uh, that may live in a high rise, you know, that's run by a corporation. I'm, I'm sure that they probably have issues as well, but maybe not, not as much as like you would, or maybe even I would, because we're more down on the street level. We're, you know, we're more in the community, I guess you'd say, as opposed to being so isolated. But um, yeah, I don't know, what, you know, I don't know what, what my uh, thing is going to be. You know, I can't even plan it. At least you can, I, you can plan moving. I, I can't right now. Cause you know, I just don't know what's going to happen here. What, what, what my mom and, and then, Oh, it's just a stressful, you know, thing. But I mean, I'm going to stay around the general area. It's not like I'm going to move to, you know, Timbuktu. I mean, it's just, uh, I'll either stay out this way or go back towards the city. Either way, that doesn't affect anybody that wants to train, you know? Um, but if I decide to get a regular gig, I'll probably have to move closer to the city. So there's more job opportunities and I can, um, you know, make a livable wage. That's, that's part of the problem out here in this rural area. You cannot uh, make a livable wage, you know, um, it's just, it's just not feasible. And especially now with so many people out of work and there's a lot of guys and gals that have, you know, uh, good work experience, work history. My, my history would be in management or, you know, motivation or sales or something. Cause you know, I've been my own boss for years and I, you know, train people, coach. So that's kind of like a management position. How I, you know, I know how to deal with people in that regard. And um, so that would probably be something that I would have to look into, uh, you know, but um, yeah. So, and, you know, we normally talk about training tips and thoughts like that, but you know, there's, I know they just had a UFC fight, but, most of the people I know just aren't really training, you know, right now they're um, doing other things or they're out of the loop. You know, they're, I, I think people realized we were talking about this last week um, or not last week, but last time, you know, that, that, uh, their training, their, whoever they're working out with their sport training, there's really more important things than that right now. And like, I know what's going on in Chicago with some of the violence every time, a lot of people know that I want to move back and they're like, why would you move back? What's so violent? This is the thing. There's a lot of people out there now that, that maybe I'll use a lack for lack of a better term, living in fear. And this is why I think training and training with somebody like me now that self-defense oriented now is absolutely the most critical time, you know, to learn how to, you know, deal with this, um, you know, to, to prote learning how to protect yourself, learning how to not look and act like a victim. And, um, you know, and there's more to it than just the physical. There's a lot of it is mental, psychological, emotional. Um, and the vast majority of the sport uh, training does not cover that. 
it just it just doesn't you know it's just not geared for that and nothing wrong with that because they they have their focus which is winning tournaments mine is different you know um i'd rather you know teach you how to deal with uh the stress of life and 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 the uh, unpredictability of it right now and i know that's what uh, appeals to you nico because you're very street oriented um yeah and i told, told my buddy vince you know he lives in Lincoln Park, and just the other day there was a Lincoln Park uh, robbery, and they beat up some woman and everything. And that Lincoln Park, for those who don't know, that's high lying. You know, that's a pretty uh, exclusive area. You know, and yeah, things can happen anywhere. You know, as we mentioned the last time, no matter where you're at, when you're the victim of a violent crime, there's no more dangerous place on the face of the earth than where you're at at that moment when you're, you know, when you're on the hot seat. So. Um, yeah, people need to start preparing for that. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think it's a, a big misconception that, I mean, yes, obviously the city has got a lot more people. There's a lot more poverty in areas of violence. But uh, to your point, it can happen anywhere. I had a reminder just yesterday. Um, you know, I live kind of in a, you know, very, you know, well-to-do, relatively speaking, suburb, very quaint and, and, and uh, quiet. But you know, the economy has been on a downturn for a while. And so there's more and more people in desperate situations and, uh, you know, addiction, you know, like they talk about this opioid crisis that's touching all parts all across the country. And this is even before the COVID thing. Uh, there's a lot of things where a lot of people are in desperate situations. And we had, I had a guy, um, he was begging at this intersection. Like I said, it's a well-to-do area. You would never expect it. Uh, but it almost turned into a thing. I was kind of watching it and thinking maybe there was, I was going to have to intercede or do something. Uh, he was begging for money, young guy, you know, tatted up. And he must have misread or he had some interaction with someone in a car and it was escalating. But the light changed and they were able to go. But he was definitely, it looked like something was going to go down and you had to be ready. And it just was kind of a reminder to me that, you know, life is there's constant chaos and you don't know who you're going to be mixing with and for me to have some degree of confidence that i can be safe you know wherever i go or have have an idea of what to do it's kind of like like having a fire extinguisher in your house you know god forbid you know you hopefully your your house is built you never have issues with your wiring or firing but you you need to know how to use that fire extinguisher just in case it gives you some peace of mind you know you need that fire alarm there it's the same thing with physical safety you know and it can happen anywhere. I mean, if you're, if you're out and about, uh, you know, you just can't assume, well, if I, you know, unless I, even if you completely isolate yourself, but that's no life either. So, I mean, I guess to, I agree to your point that um, to me, self-defense training and just knowledge of safety is just a fundamental uh, thing of life that you need to know. And um, yeah, regardless of where you live, you, you're not going to be able to run far enough away from other people. You know, they're just, and so anyways, yeah, I just had a sober reminder yesterday. I had a reminder recently too about, I think it was about four weeks ago. I'm doing a job up in Aurora and, and normally I do jobs in Aurora. I do jobs all around the suburbs. Never thought of Aurora as a bad neighborhood, but this particular part of Aurora I was working in is kind of rough. And, um, so we're, we're taking out areas of the grass and turning them into parking areas because there's no parking. It's a big apartment complex. So I got to, we got to the job and they have these little entryways to get into the apartment. And there was like, it looked like a seance. There's all these candles set up in the entryway. So one of the maintenance guys came out and he was talking to the guys I work with in Spanish. And he was telling them what happened. And he said, our, our blacktop guys were there grading out all the grass. And as soon as they pulled away, a guy came up. He was walking home to his apartment. Another guy pulled in the driveway and just shot him dead. And he died right there in the entryway. So that's that was the reason why all the candles were there. Um, but yeah, you could see the bullet holes right through the wall. They got him. And they must have been a pretty good shot because um, it was... I'd say about 20 yards, at least from, from the driveway to where he got shot dead. Um, but normally, I mean, you wouldn't think of there being a threat to you being shot in Aurora, but 
was definitely everywhere and and it's pretty rough part of town i was working in for about a month well i was eating yesterday and this lady was that i saw there you know, told me that you know her house got burglarized but years ago but just recently the neighbor that lives behind her had a break attempted break in um so you know the the, the thing is yes it's it's everywhere and I, I think a lot of people get lulled into a false sense of security, you know, and there's more to it than self, uh, than physical hand to hand combat. Um, you, you have to know the signs. You have to know how not to, you know, um, become like stalked in a way. I don't, and I don't mean stalking like an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend stalking. I'm talking like, you know, you can be, um, you know, targeted, and they'll case you, you know, they'll case the joint. They'll see your whereabouts. They'll see what time you come and go and uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's what you have to be leery of. You have to be very concerned that that doesn't happen. And like we talked about last time, um, you have to be systematically unsystematic, you know, uh, and it's easier said than done. Sometimes there's just no way around it. You, you've got to be out of your house at seven and you won't get back till six, no matter, no matter what. Um, so then you have to take a different approach. And one of the things is you have to have someone like myself assess your daily life. You know, I, I would have to look and see what your patterns are, what your habits are, and then how we can set it up to trick someone into thinking that, you know, you're not there. Um, or to, uh, to trick them into thinking that you're there or somebody is there in your premises. Uh, you know, an old ploy uh, used to be where they would get your home phone number and then he would call your home phone. And if nobody answered the phone, well then boom, nobody's there. Now a lot of people don't have home phones. They have cell phones. So they kind of, in a way it's not foolproof, but it kind of changed things. But uh you know, watch what you post on, on your Facebook or whatever the, you know, the Instagram or whatever people use. Don't put out your, you know, personal information or put out false information now and then, you know, oh, you know, I'm not, you know, like, let's say, for example, you, you, your vacation is coming up and you, you're going to, I don't know, Hawaii, right? Don't definitely don't post that, but just say, oh yeah, vacation's coming up. Like, good time. I'm going to be staying at home. I'm not leaving. I'm going to get work done around the house. It needs to get work. You know, it needs to get done. Right. Total, total smoke screen. You know, do not let people know that you're not going to be there. Do not let people know that there may be somebody vulnerable in your house. And I'm going to tell other, so I'm going to say this too. Don't think your dog is going to be a deterrent. You know, even though your dog may be, you know, uh, part of the Doberman gang, if you guys remember that movie, um, you can't, the, burglars, if they're intent on breaking in, they're not going to worry about your dog. Okay. Some of them won't even worry about you, but you know, you, you just have to always plan for the worst and, you know, and hope for the best. But if you don't have a plan at all, you know, that's troubling. So uh, don't leave valuables around uh, uh, plan like, okay, you're like your television sets and things. You can't hide a television set, but thankfully nowadays, televisions aren't the, like, they're not super duper expensive unless you want to go nuts and buy something that's state of the art. Um, you have to make an assessment. How much are you willing to lose in the case of a break-in? What is irreplaceable to you? Okay. Are there things like, let's say jewelry or whatever, or mementos that are, you know, truly, um, irreplaceable. If so, you know, get yourself a huge safe. It's worth the, worth the investment, you know, uh, and I don't believe they're that expensive. So like, you know, um, when I moved in here, there's a safe down in the basement that's from the 1890s. I think it's like, I mean, it's amazingly huge. You, you guys have seen it, but it's like, I don't have the combination for it. <clears throat> and honestly, it's the insides are really small, but you can get like a gun safe or something like that and put, you know, put valuables in there. Um, I really wouldn't use a gun safe, to be honest with you, though, because a lot of people want a gun. You know, they want to rob them. Oh, they think they see a gun safe. They think you might have stuff in there. <clears throat> but you, you just got to find hiding spots. 
and places for things <clears throat> that are irreplaceable. And if it's and if it's stuff that you're you don't need or you're not going to use all the time, like let's say it's your grandma's wedding ring or something that you, you never wear but it's sentimental, put it in a safety deposit box in a bank. You know, don't run the risk of having stuff like that in your house. Um, you know, I could elaborate, but there's there's a lot of things like that that you you have to do to, you know, kind of de-stress yourself, you know. So if in the if worst case happens and you do get burglarized, you know, they're going to take relatively replaceable items. Um so if you have like an Xbox or things like that, again, you could probably put that away, stash that somewhere that would be difficult for them to find. Every everybody's house is different, everybody's setup is different, but um, you know, don't think a camera or a dog is going to be the ultimate in deterrent because you know it may not be. It's only I've heard of people um, like burglars going door to door ring the doorbell just to see if you're home and, and if somebody answers they'll they'll ask for someone that you know doesn't live there and uh i was wondering if you're in that situation what what do you think the best thing to do is somebody's knocking at your door he's probably a burglar uh what should you do just answer the door and tell him to get lost or what well i mean it could be a burglar or it could be a scam artist as well you know there is a difference like uh home remodeling scams or uh home energy scams. I, I have to be very leery about that, especially with on the telephone because of my mother, you know, who's susceptible to things like that. And a lot of people are susceptible to that. Um, yeah, you know, there's a, there's, here's, here's one of the problems. Let's say you do answer the door. Let, 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 let's say you're a 70 year old lady, right? And you know, you answer the door to this guy. He may not be there today, to do to do some harm, but he's um, what's not canvassing. What's the word I'm looking for? He's assessing the situation, okay? And he may, you know, you cannot give out any kind of tells, you know, you meaning if you're a 70 year old lady or whatever. I'm just pointing. I'm just trying to make an example of somebody who may look like a victim. Um, don't let this burglar think or potential burglar think that you live alone, even if you do. You know, give the impression that there may be other people there or that they, if they're not there at this moment, they're going to be there shortly. The minute you, leave, you let somebody in your house, you're giving them more access to case the joint. They can look around. Even if there's no objects out in the open, they'll see how you live, okay? Like if, you're a, if you live in a pigsty, like you're a hoarder and this and that, you know, they may just say, oh, well, this guy's, there's nothing here of value. But if you they walk in, they see a nice television, they see expensive uh, the furniture or, you know, it's, it's well kept and you, you look neat, you know, and appearing and you may have jewelry on, they're going to think, okay, this, this is, this is potential here. I could have a target. Um, this is a target rich environment. Um, you gotta, you just, you just have to watch for things like that. Um, so I would not let them in per se. Uh, you know, you do have to make the assessment of what is this all about? You could talk to them in the door you know, they, they could, you know, be out on the porch. Um, and I don't know if you're alluding to the fact that they're going to strong arm you and, you know, and, and come in and, and do your right then and there. If, if, th if that is happening, uh, you know, if you, if you have records of that happening in your neighborhood, then don't open the door. Regardless, if I was the person, the homeowner or the, whatever the renter, I would try to get as much information off of this person. What is your name? What's, what's your business? What do you, why are you here? Ask for identification. Okay. First and foremost, can I see an ID? You know, if the guy says, Hey, I'm Joe Cardinal with, uh, you know, the uh, Chicago Tribune. Okay. Mr. Cardinal, do you have identification? Can you prove you're Joe Cardinal? Can you prove that you're with the Chicago Tribune? That's first and foremost. And regardless, after it's all over and done with, um, I'd call your local police. I'd say, hey, somebody here claiming to be a man named Joe Cardinal, who's, you know, about 48, six foot, 180 pounds, was at my house. I got a bad, uneasy feeling. Uh, you know, describe the person, you know, make a mental note of it, you know, and, and call the local authorities. Call your 
police department or sheriff or whatever it is. And uh, that that's really important. Um, if someone who's claiming to be uh, a businessman of, of any sort, if they don't want to give their personal, you know, their identification, be very suspicious. You know, um, just like sometimes when I have a problem with, let's say, Comcast or something, and you get a, you know, and you're having a hard time with the uh, the customer service rep, and they're, they're like, my name is Joe. Joe what? Well, we don't give out last names. Okay, escalate this to a manager because you have all my information. You know my name. You know my phone number. You know my address. I don't trust you now. Okay, we're not on equal footing here. So get me to a customer's, get me to a, 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 elevate this to the next level. So that's what you need to do when you're, when somebody like that comes to your door. Um, especially if they're claiming to represent a business of some sort, they don't have a storefront. They don't have a website. They don't have, you know, you have no way of knowing what this person really is. And if they don't want to cooperate, then you say, please leave. And then I would immediately call the police immediately. That's my take on it. So you wouldn't just not answer the door? You definitely would answer it? I didn't say you know, nothing in my life is definite. I play things by ear. But if you don't answer, the, the important thing to do is if, if, you don't, if you don't feel comfortable opening or answering the door, then do this. If they're knocking on your door and they're, they're, they're canvassing, watch them. Don't open the door. Wait till they leave. Watch them. And if they go to your neighbors or someone across the street, then you know, okay, well, this guy's going is going door to door. Um, still doesn't mean they're not a burglar. Still doesn't mean they're a scam, not, not a scam artist, but, um, I don't know your life. And I don't mean you, but the person in, in general, uh, like he, me here where I live, there's literally no reason for anybody to knock on the door. If they are a canvasser, it's, it's nothing I need. I don't wait for canvassers to come to me. If I need something, I'm going to go get it. So there's really no reason for me to open the door. I'll do it if it would happen because I'm not worried about it, you know, because I can defend myself. So I, I don't, I don't worry about it, but others may not be in that position. So they'd have to ask themselves, why do I have a knock on the door? And be careful of these delivery people now. Okay. Because that's another scam. Okay. Um, you have people who are delivering packages in unmarked vehicles or with no uniform or, or Uber delivery or DoorDash or, or, or this and that, you know, um, you have to be really alert, almost cynical, you know, even if you didn't order food, maybe they'll come up, up to you with a bag that looks like, you know, they'll knock on the door. I'm here for, here's the delivery. Well, I didn't deliver. I didn't order anything, <laughs> you know, and it could be legit. They could have the wrong address or they could be there to rob you. There's a lot of scams going on now. And, it, there, you know, as, as technology and times change, criminals be, can become, you know, very creative. Because the art of scamming, it's a science like magic. Like once a magician knows principles of magic, they can create their own tricks. Or they can buy magic tricks off of other magicians or magician supply companies. And that's the same with scams, okay? They can... Uh, create new scams because they're creative or they can borrow scams from, you know, wh what they heard other people are, are pulling. And it's up to you as the consumer or you as the, uh, you know, the, the, whatever the person, whatever you would call the victim, not, you don't want to become a victim, but whatever a non-victim would be called the target um, to be aware of all these things. So I cannot answer that question of don't answer the door. Um, you, if you don't, then, Maybe they'll leave a card. If they don't, then you're going to be you're going to be wondering what was this all about. Are they going to come back? And then what? what what's going to happen if they come back? You know, it's just it's just one of those things that you have to look at the overall picture. That's why I said earlier, I'd have to assess your whole schedule, your whole life. I'd I'd have to know if you were if you wanted to hire me as a consultant for something like that. I'd have to know pretty much. You'd have to trust in me to know, I'd have to know your movements. I'd have to know what's going on. You know, um, it may be different for you because you have children and you don't know, maybe something, maybe your two kids got into it like, or your, your kid and some other kid. And now it's the parent of that other kid that's coming to the door to talk to you. See what I mean? 
it, there's just so many, yeah, so many scenarios. But definitely, if you decide to open the door, get the ID. If you don't open the door, then they're going to know. They're going to assume that you're not home. Are you comfortable letting people think that you're not home? Can you, you know, what about you? If I came or somebody that you didn't know came knocking on the door right now, would you answer it? I would answer it. I mean, I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. So I definitely would answer it. But uh, for someone that maybe could not defend themselves, I don't know what the best scenario would be. Because if you don't answer it, they might think you're not home and they might just bust in right there. You know, so. Well, that's the whole point. The The thing is, you don't want to be that person that can't defend themselves, okay? You you need to set up a plan. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to become as, as tough, you know, the toughest man in the world or the toughest woman in the world. Um, but you, you can have alternate uh, solutions that may not even involve a f- one-on-one -on -one or hand-to-hand -hand combat situation. You know, um, you may have a weapon of some sort. It doesn't even have to be a gun. Um, but more importantly, if you're, if you're truly not able to defend yourself, okay, then you need to look for alternate escape routes, okay? Is, is that painting on the wall, is that wristwatch that you have worth losing your life for? Or is it worth you know, a long-term hospital stay. Um, I can tell you that in some of the apartments that I lived in when I was younger, the entry and the exit were on basically the same wall, okay? Uh, the Two doors on the same wall. Uh, that's not good. I'm like you. I don't care. I, nobody's going to kick my ass. But the point is, if I was 90 years old, uh, you don't want that. You, you want to be able to have... Um, uh, front, let's say a front door and a back door or a side door. So maybe if somebody knocks on the door and you're concerned, don't answer it. Go to the other door. Go to the other door. So if they do attempt to break in, get out that side door or back door, whatever the case may be. Okay. And, and don't own a house or don't rent an apartment or condo or whatever that has doors that are adjoining where if you go out the other door, you're going to, you know, you're not going to really have a great success escape and you, and you kind of want to look, you want to be able to see what's going on at your door. Does not mean that they can't be sharp and shrewd and have guys standing at other areas. You know, it could be more than one person, but you know, there's only so much you can do, you know, um, you know, you, you get my drift. I mean, but you got to plan all this stuff out. This is all part of planning. Or, or some people that have homes, nice homes, they've created what's called safe rooms, okay? Now, a safe room doesn't have to mean a room that's basically never being used. What it means is you have a door in your safe room that's impenetrable, okay? Not a piece of shit wood door, you know, a, a very strong door with maybe a uh, reinforced um uh, door frame that they're not going to break into this. Okay. They're just not going to get into it. All right. And you, you make it to your safe room. Okay. That that's the thing. And you practice this now and then, you know, how can you get to your safe room quickly and make sure, you know, it's locked and it's, you know, this and that. Um, again, a renter can't do that, but a homeowner certainly can. And trust me to make a safe room, isn't going to be that expensive. And naturally, you want to have your cell phone or have a phone, you know, somewhere, some way to call 911 um, to get the police there uh, in time while you're in your safe room. Um, I would be a very strong advocate of that for people who, uh, you know, have the ability or make it your basement, you know, put, put a door on your basement that nobody's going to break through. Okay. And you can easily talk to a contractor or a construction guy or something like that. Uh, that could that could do that um, for you, and yeah, nobody's going to get through that door. And all you need to do is wait and call nine one one. What are your thoughts, Joe? You look like a guy that lives in fear. 
True, but that's just, you know, there's so many layers to that. It's hard to cover it in the time we have left. But um, How much time do we have left? Uh, uh, only about 15 minutes, so maybe just a couple thoughts. Um, but I do think if someone's at your door, you can always call out to them like, hey, not, not interested, you know, like they can hear that you're there without, because once you crack that door, like you said, if they, especially if they're crowding the door, if they're close enough, I mean, it's kind of like the same thing if you're on the street. If someone gets close enough to be able to reach you, um, you've got to be kind of on like level, you know, level orange alert, you know, that, that it just takes a split second for them to throw, change their weight and shift and, and, and bird barge in on you. So, I mean, before you even open that seal of a door, you can kind of alert them, Hey, what is this about? I'm busy. Or, you know, you can kind of act grouchy and kind of, so at least they know someone's there or just a minute, I got to put the dog away, you know, or I don't know, whatever. You can kind of do stuff like that. Um, but I am nervous, yeah, like even when people, because I'd say once, twice, a, well, I mean, twice a month, someone will be coming to my door and we even have a sign up, no solicitors, but they don't look at it. They just ring the bell and they want to, you know, sometimes it's kids selling candy and, um, you know, those I intimidate very quickly. But um, the, you know, the, uh, um, you know, it's something I think it's very routine for people to come to the door and try and, you know, oh, we want to redo your windows or whatever. And. Um, you know, if they start coming up the steps, to me, they should be far enough away so that I should be able to, I wouldn't open the door if I felt they were, be, were close enough to be able to grab the knob or push in. At that point, I'd be yelling at them through the door. Hey, you're not interested or, you know, whatever. At least, can you please get off the porch? Step back. You could do that. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's the same thing when, there's, when, when you're outside too. If someone's encroaching, once they're close enough to be able to reach and grab you, that's a split second the fight is on. And um, so... I think, you know, commanding or asking for distance is, is, is appropriate before you're ever going to open the door. Um, and if they don't respond to that, then you can start dialing 911 saying, listen, I'm calling the cops because you're not listening to me. I was going to ask too, do you think, you know, not everybody's a gun owner and there's different, you know, issues with that, but just having something you could improvise as a weapon near, near each entry or near your bed. Let's say someone crashes in at night. I've got a a hammer or something I can pick up. Um, well, you know, kind of, you yeah, know. a baseball bat, whatever the case may be. Right. You, I know many people who sleep with something by their bed. Um, yeah. And I, it, I, again, part of this is peace of mind for you. Um, you know, if, if that's going to make, make it peaceful for you uh, and help you sleep and make you feel safe, that's, that's fine. There's something to that. But again, you do not want a false sense of security where this may end up costing you your life, okay? Um, so whatever it is, you better make sure you're practiced on using it. So like having a baseball bat, but I'm using that as an example. Okay, but can you use it? You know, can you wield this baseball bat enough to be effective with it, okay? So yeah, I don't have a problem with, with having weapons um, if, if you feel you need to have a weapon in your nightstand or by your bed, just make sure that you're um, uh, capable of using it, you know, effectively. And, um, and again, there's the unknown factor. Are you going to have the courage to do it? Are you going to freak? Are you going to get hysterical? Now, when that, now that's other kind of training. That's some of the training that I used to do, you know, uh, in person where, where I, I tricked your, 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 your system into um, being, uh, you know, getting your adrenaline flowing. And that's, that's intense training. And you really have to be serious. You have to have a serious commitment to go through that kind of training that I used to put people through. I used to offer a program very briefly um, because people just, you know, um, were too scared of it. Um, I had it on my website, years ago of, you know, the absolute ultimate type of training that you could get uh, of, you know, being terrorized, of being, you know, uh, never knowing when it's going to happen and it was going to happen. And I ran it by some people who were interested and it was a very expensive program, very, very expensive. And they just thought that they, were, they weren't up to it psychologically. They, this was about the closest that they were going to get to, you know, perhaps death or whatever and, uh, or, or, you know, the harrowing experience and, and just the thought of it was too much for them. 
So, you know, you've got to know that you're going to be able to pull that uh, trigger, so to speak, when, when, the, when the time comes. So, yeah, if you need to have a weapon by your bed, go ahead. But, you know, just make sure that you have the guts to use it and, and the, uh, the, 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 the proper frame of mind that you don't go into hysterics. So what kind of things did you make them do in that program? Well, it wasn't so much the things that I made them do. It was the things that I was going to do to them. Okay. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, I put them, I was, well, none of them actually went through with the program. Okay. So nobody, nobody actually trained it, which is, which is a shame, but it was about as serious as you can get um, where for sure you would have had some sort of a breakdown of everything that you thought made you, if you were a guy, everything that thought, you know, that made you a man. Um, and it, it, it just, I don't want to really get into it now. If, if I decide ever to do it again, then we go there. But some of the stuff that I would say now would probably make you think that I'm a little bit psycho, but it, it was, let me put it to you this way. It was part of it was on, like on my real world experience on events and things that had happened to me. Um, and the reason that I was charging an astronomical amount of money for it was because I would have had to pay, let's say somebody like you, a student of mine that they don't know who you are. Um, I would have had to, you know, pay you to be part of this. Okay. Because if I were to do something to them, they, once they saw me, well, they're, they're going to know, well, it's Tony, nothing's going to happen but they don't know you. And but that's all I can say. There was going to be accomplices and stuff involved, but it was going to be really in-depth. And, and, you know, there would have been a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with me on, on how to, pre how to prepare you for this. Um, so I wasn't going to just like feed you to the wolves, but there would have been a lot of things that would have, you know, potentially um, made, made you crack. Uh, it would have been cool to do that, you know, but like I said, you know, things didn't work out that way, especially back then when I was doing it, the rage was MMA or grappling tournaments. That's all anybody wanted to do, you know, especially training with me as a guy, I got this tournament. I want to win. I want to win. I want to do this and that, you know, so the market wasn't there, you know, and I am not a marketing guy. So I don't know how to market to those kind of people. The program sounds awesome, man. I'm interested. I thought it would have been great, you know, but again, it, it would have been and the money would have been like, you know, it was a lot of money and that's because, this is a serious program. It was $10,000. And that's because I wanted, if you're going to pay me a thousand dollars, you'll talk your way out of working out. I mean, it's just a thousand dollars or, Oh, well, you know, I, I worked out with him three times. So really I'm not out a thousand. Maybe I'm only out 700, whatever. You'll, you'll figure a way to justifying it. When somebody puts up 10 grand, I know they're serious and they have a serious commitment to doing this. Okay because this wasn't going to be like a weekend seminar. I mean, this is going to be thoroughly intense training, you know, probably upwards of a year of solid intense training. Um, so yeah, it just, it just never worked out, you know? Um, yeah. I offered that as a matter of fact, I think it was about 10 years, uh, 20 years ago, uh, believe it or not. Yeah. Roughly. Um, yeah. If, don't hold me to that, but I think it was something like that. And I, I advertise it for a solid year. I said, I'll give it one year. And, um, you know, I wrote up, I don't have it anymore. It was on a website, but I wrote up some of the stuff that you would have went through, but, um, and there were things that you were going to learn to do that I don't feel comfortable talking about right now publicly, but you would have been, um, you would have been Billy badass. Believe me, you, you'd have been able to do whatever needed to be done. Hey, Tony, uh, any closing thoughts here before we wrap up? Time's getting... Okay, no, I mean, uh, everybody, thanks for watching. Keep in touch. CatchRussell.com. Uh, my email address is info, I-N-F-O, at CatchRussell.com, C-A-T-C-H-W-R-E-S-T-L-E.com. This will be put on my Tony Cicchini Facebook business page, as well as Joe does Instagram, and he does um, the YouTube page. So Joe will be putting links to the website. Um, again, I'll have him put a link to the Tri C program for those who are uh, interested. And um, since we talked about the Snap No Tap, put a link to that on there. Um, you know, 
Um, and I just want to wish Nico good luck with selling his house. He's the guy right now that's got a big financial thing on the, on the burner here. Joe, you, you seem to be plugging along, you know, things I'm happy that things seem to be stable for you and going good for you. Me, I got to, you know, deal with, um, you know, my, my mom, I just noticed that the phone rang a few seconds ago and that's, uh, the caretaker calling in to check my mom's meds. So they're all messed up and we got to, we got to get that taken care of tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank everybody. And hopefully now our schedules are, are going to be aligned so we can do this every week. Um, that's what we wanted. And, uh, yeah. What do you guys have to say for the closing thoughts? Oh, just, it was a good discussion. Glad to, glad to talk to you guys again. Yeah. It's good to talk to you guys. Thanks yes. for the insights, Tony. Oh, well, you know, I wish we were talking, maybe next week we can talk about more training, you know, just like fighting tips and techniques on, you know, how to do holds and stuff. Just don't, you know, don't you know, feel free to ask me. I'll answer as much as I can. Sometimes it's hard to just describe it. You have to visualize it or see it, but yeah. Um, so maybe that's something we can do next week. Right guys. Sounds good. good. Okay. Then I guess this is it. This is goodbye until next week. Thanks everybody for watching. All right. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.